Welcome to Canada's podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Phil Blith, founder and CEO of Canada's podcast, coming to you today from Toronto. Today we're going to meet Graham Barlow, who's a Forex founder and is now CEO of Iversoft. He's co-founded four companies, including a digital currency company in the early 2000s that was bought uh, in 2010. He co-founded Rocket Owl, for those of you that know social gaming, and he sold that one as well. And in 2014, he co-founded ProPet Software, an industry-leading business management platform for the pet industry, which is still operating and is privately held. But in 2016, he joined Iversoft to help build a world-class software development agency that specialized in mobile and emerging technology. Since joining the company, they have moved from about 500K in annual revenues to generating more than 45 million in lifetime services revenues. Quite a, quite a, quite a kick. Uh, as a serial entrepreneur for the last two days, Graham's ventures have spanned, oh, multiple industries, has employed hundreds of people globally, and, you know, done really well. He's, he's a pretty seasoned investor and advisor, and I'm looking forward to our conversation with him. So welcome, Graham. Uh, uh, great to meet you. Um, and as I normally do, uh, before we get too deep and too involved in our conversation, uh, start off by telling us a little bit about you, what you do, you know, and how you got onto Canada's podcast kind of thing. Not the, not the actual <laughs> physical call or whatever, but, you know, you're an entrepreneur. So tell us a little bit about it. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Really excited to be here and excited to dig into some good conversation. I've been a tech entrepreneur effectively my entire life. Got kind of pulled into it extremely early uh, in building online communities and selling items from online games back in 2000. Uh, ended up building a company around that for about six years before selling it. Uh, from there, ended up co-founding a game development company called Rocket Owl uh, that we launched games on Facebook in the kind of social impact, um, eco-friendly zone at the height of kind of Zynga and Farmville and all the madness <laughs> there. Built it up over a million players. Um, ended up selling that at the after a pretty crazy, crazy journey there. Um, spent a couple of years uh, after that working with the group that had acquired us investing in early stage SaaS companies through a small fund that we had set up. Mm -hmm. I co-founded a company called Pro Pet Software, which is business management tools for the pet industry. Um, that's still operating privately today with a couple million customers. And then about eight years ago, while we were doing the investment side of things, got enticed by two founders I had met previously that were looking at starting a liquid cooling hardware company for data centers and high performance computers mm -hmm. and seemed really exciting tied well into my gaming background uh, mm -hmm. but every friend mentor advisor and person i knew uh told me hardware was a horrible horrible idea and don't do hardware you're a software person um and so i ended up countering um after they had asked if i would be interested in coming in as a co-founder and ceo with yes but you also have this software company over here called Iversoft um, that at the time was a team of five or six, had been around for a few years, but just kind of finding its way. And so I, if I come in to, to do Liquid Fox, which was our um, liquid cooling company, uh, mm -hmm. if hardware is as awful as everyone tells me it is, um, I also want to be a partner in the software thing. And if we don't do the hardware stuff, then let's go build the, the software company. And six months into the hardware, hardware is awful. Don't recommend it. <laughs> and pivoted into into software and since then we've grown iversoft into the high eight figures uh scaled the team to more than 50 across the country and done multiple acquisitions um and been having an amazing time and then still still doing that with the majority of my time we've also since then launched a coaching organization helping uh companies scale up to their first five million and mm -hmm. still actively invest in early stage B2B SaaS companies. So that's kind cool. of kind of my role. But, and then I get to hang out with cool people like you on podcasts. <laughs> but I'm interested, you know, you uh, you joined Iversoft, you know, instead of starting another new venture. I mean, yeah. uh, which makes you in the lexicon 
more of an entrepreneur than an entrepreneur <clears throat> or not? I mean, what's your perspective? I mean, from being like the founder to being the kind of the partner, the partner. Yeah. D different kind, different kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, for me, it's, it was interesting, right? Because when I, when I left cash it and pro pet, I was leaving to be a founder in the liquid cooling company. And that was kind of the, the main jump was go start that thing. Um, yeah. and the periphery to that was there's also an opportunity to lean into Iversoft. And Iversoft at the time had done some really cool stuff, but by virtue of kind of where Matt and Vicky's backgrounds come from, like Vicky had interned at Apple and come up through the like Apple secret police of don't speak to anyone for anything ever. Um, <laughs> and Matt had come up through mechanical engineering in the automotive world where it was also like, don't speak to anyone ever, or we throw wrenches at you. Mm -hmm. Um, they built a great company that they didn't tell anyone about, had no sales or marketing, and was kind of the best kept secret working on mobile stuff. And so it very much kind of felt like a kind of founding moment of establishing real sales and marketing process, real um, growth practice. And I mean, we very, very, very quickly took the company from a couple hundred grand in revenue um, up to millions and then 10 million plus. So it's been sort of entrepreneur, but as a full kind of equity partner in the business and um, mm. also treating it a little bit like a venture studio at times where it's like we get a first look at a lot of early stage companies when we're doing software development. And mm -hmm. we've used that as a vehicle to participate in seed rounds, to make angel investments, to invest as Iversoft. So still get to dabble a little bit in the founder focused world of, of launching cool products and, and getting it mm -hmm. on the ground floor. So you're kind of a, a trailing founder or whatever. Yeah. A founder yeah. in residence, founder in residence, F founder in residence, re re yeah. slightly oh, reformed, but not retired. <laughs> you know, uh, you're still an entrepreneur. I, you know, I can oh, yeah. tell by talking to you. What's different about us guys? You know, what, what, why, why is there such an interest in entrepreneurship by people that really don't understand it? Um, it's interesting. I think <clears throat> for me, I'm unbelievably unemployable. Um, I do not do I know, I know well <laughs> <laughs> in other frameworks and like literally have an almost physiological response to other people telling me what to do. Like, even if you're giving me good advice, and this was really true when I was a young founder, less yeah. true now. I'm better at like receiving advice and learning from yeah. people. Yeah. But like, you could be like, there is a fire, run away. You have to run away. And I'd be like, do I? What if I just stand here? Maybe I'll stand here for my own because I can. Um, and so, like, that, that innate desire that I just I wanted to choose my own path was a, was an early foundation. Um, I got into entrepreneurship and the whole ecosystem, honestly, as kind of a survival mechanism because I, I was escaping not the best home environment and not the best ecosystem. And so it was a way of creating independence, a way of creating yeah. my own opportunity. I was an abysmal student because, again, sitting in a desk and doing what I was told, not so good. Mm -hmm. um, and then where it's kind of evolved is... It's the ultimate kind of competitive expression where you get to build anything and compete and thrive against some of the best, most creative and interesting people in the world. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Discover the latest trends, strategies, and success stories in the ever-evolving world of business. Canadaspodcast.com subscribe now. How about you? What pulled you into it? I think, you know... I wouldn't say I'm unemployable, but um, I, you know, I went to GM school. I did this, I did that, and um, went back to university. And I thought I'm going to be a teacher. And my friends who I respect said, "Bill, get real, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Stupid, okay." So solid I, endorsement. I, so I ended up moving into a, a, a business life and. 
very quickly kind of found myself in, you know, I didn't want to go back to corporate world, so I I, I went into smaller business and ended up, you know, building things. So that, and I love building things. I'm a tech guy. I mean, I went, you know, did GM school, da 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 da. So I'm a language, I'm a marketing guy, and a tech guy. So I ended up triple here. threat. That's right. So that's really it. I love it. The, the, you know, the, and I'm interested. I've been asking people about this. You know, the last four years have been really weird. Okay. Um, let's see about the other. <clears throat> uh, yeah. And we've seen such a lot of changes. But, uh, can you tell us a little bit? Is there some reflection? Uh, on some of that stuff that you can pass on to people in terms of, you know, running a business, building a business, funding a business, that kind of thing. Absolutely. I I like, I think the last four years, I mean, in in some ways as someone who very much grew up on the internet and built my first couple of companies very much online, um, felt like I've been training for this my whole life of like the whole world's gone online. I was like, excellent. I know what to do here. but I think it was, it's also been the ultimate test on how founders can pivot proactively versus reactively. I think that's one of the biggest things. And I'm, I'm proud to say, I think we were able to take a pretty proactive stance in terms of how we went remote with Iversoft, what that strategy looked like, how that paid off for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, in the height of, in the height of that, we tripled the company in about a year and a half um, on the back of, really good talent acquisition strategy, really good growth strategies, um, obviously high demand in the space, but at the same time, making a lot of the right moves from a people and culture perspective that when the market was crazy and nobody could hire, we were filling roles within two to three weeks with some of the highest caliber talent in the world. So to me, it goes back a little bit to what we said about entrepreneurship is like entrepreneurship is kind of the ultimate expression of creativity and competition. I, I think you never know what market condition you're going to be put into. You never know what's going to be thrown at the company and being able to not be so set in your philosophy of this is who we are. This is how we operate. This is the golden rule and it cannot change is critical to navigate and grow through uncertain and challenging times. And I think one stark contrast or or reminder for me of that is um, and challenging old assumptions. I look at like, Pre going remote during COVID, we had a work from home policy at Ibersoft, which was great. With manager approval, you could work from home one day every two months, um, as long as it was scheduled well in advance. And we, I think, approved 60 or 70% of the requests. (laughs) We went from that to fully remote and distributed across the country in two weeks and kind of made it work and went all in on investing in the tools and the resources to make that happen. Mm-hmm. But clearly that was not a, a core part of our ethos and philosophy prior to that. But I think when you when you see situations like that, being willing to make a decisive call and go all in on it is is huge. And we saw a lot of companies that kind of half did it, half didn't do it, really struggled. Um, we're seeing it now with a lot of companies that are flip-flopping back and forth on are we back yeah. to work? Or like, are we back to office? Are we remote? Are we not? We hired a bunch of people that are distributed everywhere, and now we're going to force them all to move, relocate. And so there's a huge shuffle in the um, job market in general. Um, Mm -hmm. I think one of the other big things, and it's interesting, right before this uh, coming on the podcast, I was having a, a deep chat about this with the founder, but like being extremely proactive about how you manage finances and cash flow in the business is also huge. Um, we've been fortunate. We have a really good finance team and we pretty proactively try and manage the facilities that we have access to, whether that's kind of a floating, um, line of credit for accounts receivable or just general lines of credit or good relationship with BDC or RBC or different, different facilities Mm -hmm. when everything is good. Right. And this is the thing that I think a lot of founders miss is like when times are good, they don't talk to the bank. And they don't spend time building relationships which in the is, finance which world. Which is when you should be talking to them. Which, yeah. which is ab- like on your best yeah. day, when you are celebrating yeah. your biggest win, call the bank. Call the bank. That's right. Tell them. That's show right. them. <laughs> right? Because 
Because what doesn't go well is when the first phone call they get from you in three years is when you're in a crisis and you need money to make payroll the next week. Because they have no context on how the business is doing. They have no confidence in what your consistency is. And you're starting that relationship from scratch. Whereas if you can establish some of that credit, if you can establish some of that flexibility before you need it, it's a lot easier to operate it when one of your customers unexpectedly doesn't pay you on time. Like we, about a year ago, we had two of our largest enterprise clients that are on net 30 contracts inform us that new corporate policy was they would be paying net 90 and we just needed to eat that <laughs> and they're like you could you can fight it but this is this is like this is the new stance from the billing departments hopefully mm-hmm. it'll change back at some point and it was like well all of a sudden you're floating multiple six figure a month contracts for three extra months you need to have a plan for that and you need to have relationships yeah. that can help you solve that and if you don't, you die. And so I'm I'm huge on just being, yeah, super, super proactive. Like be optimistic in your forecasting and your sales and how you approach that. Be so pessimistic on how you manage cash flow. Assume everyone's gonna be late, assume you're gonna chase everyone, assume everything gets hung up in wire transfers and everything else, and have systems so that when all of that goes sideways, you're still okay. With over 700 episodes and 500 news articles, we are your go-to source for all things entrepreneurship. Canada's podcast.com subscribe now. Great, some great advice there. Brilliant. It's just super. Um, you've faced a lot of challenges growing these businesses. Have you, have you kind of found a process that you use that helps you go from, you know, get round the wall, over the wall, whatever you want to say? Is, is there some kind of process that you, you use to do that? Yeah. Absolutely. And it's it's one that I I think my team sometimes makes fun of me for and other founders that I talk to make fun of me. But um, I've gotten very, very, very good at the reflexive muscle of problem hits me immediately go to my network. Who do I know that's done this before or who in what company has solved this before? Like I try not to net new figure anything out myself. And I try to immediately go, okay, if I, if I haven't solved this, Accenture has, and there's probably someone smaller than Accenture that has. So my job over the next 24 hours is to find somebody in the world that has dealt with this thing before, solved it once, and I can buy them coffee. I can fly out to them. I can do something to go have mm-hmm. a conversation with them and say, hey, what did you do? And like we've built communities like Fresh Founders, and there's organizations like YPO and EO and others that, that make this mm-hmm. kind of accelerated. But I think... One of the most important things you can do as a founder is have and curate a phenomenal network of awesome people so that when something unexpected hits you, you're not scrambling to figure it out net new and you can lean on people to talk to. And when people lean on you, answer them Um, because like you, you give back into that ecosystem and the ecosystem gives back to you when you need it. That's really good advice. Speaking about advice. What's the best piece of advice that you've received, you know, that you carry, that, that's there all the time in the back of your mind, you know, it, it just won't go away kind of thing? Yeah, I think the the one one quote I got when I was 21 and we closed around a rocket hole and one of the lead investors and ended up becoming one of my, my best friends, um, uh, a gentleman named Tim Kimber. And I, I kind of brushed off a little bit at the time, but over the years has been been reinforced over and over again. And he said, 50% of everything is showing up. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting to me about that is the number of times in my career and throughout my life where I've hit points where whether it's a late night event or a flight or something, I'm just, I'm not feeling it. I don't have the energy for it. I'm like exhausted. We've got a hundred other things going on. As soon as I feel like, ah, I don't know. That's almost become a leading indicator for me if I need to go show Mm -hmm. up because I don't know who I'm going to run into, what's going to happen. And what's kind of crazy to me now that we're also spending more time on the investment side is it's truly remarkable finding people that show up consistently over extended periods of time. You can see a ton of hustle and consistency from founders for 60, 90, 120 days. When I meet founders that are like, 
I'm going to give you an update on my business every month. And I can look back in my inbox and I have a monthly update from them over two, three, four years. Those are the ones that are building stuff. Those are the ones that are actually moving the needle. And that kind of consistency compounding over time to build incredible companies, incredible results, incredible networks is huge. And so like 50% of it might be skill and talent and whatever, but literally 50% of it just show up every time consistently. And you're halfway there. You're already ahead of the vast majority of people. Cool. Good, good, good observations. Okay, let's have some fun. Let's move to a rapid fire because I, I look at my schedule. We've got about five, ten minutes left. Okay. But if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing instead? I would run a collectible card store. Collectible card store? Magic nice. cards, Pokemon cards. That is that is my guilty pleasure. If I'm stressed out about oh. work, I buy a ton of cards and open them. You know, what what book are you currently reading, listening to, podcast, whatever? Or what you know, what what what's kind of exciting you? Uh biggest one lately has been Buy Back Your Time from Dan Martell. Um mm -hmm. love it, been pushing it through all of our teams and companies. Um, I think between that and $100 million leads, those are two of the best business books I've seen come out in the last five, 10 years. Are you a morning or a night person? Morning. Okay. You it used to be night. Mm -hmm. It's changed. I, I'm morning yeah. as of the last nine months. Prior to yeah. that, I was a like, see me at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. person. Now I'm done by like 10 in the evening, but I'm up at four oh, every morning did, workouts. Why did you change? Uh, partially a push from my coach and just okay. getting a lot more emphasis on physical fitness and okay. recognizing okay. the amount of energy that came from that and how much my productivity increased, uh, mm -hmm. through that shift. If you have to pick one word to describe Graham Barlow, what would it be and why? Persistent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I think I think my my greatest strength is still sticking around. Um, yeah. I love I love what I do, and I love the people I get to build stuff with. And so persistence ultimately be again like consistency over a ridiculously long period of time means you win. Uh, nothing happens as quickly as we want it to, and so most of the big wins are the overnight success that took ten years to build beforehand. Uh, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Uh, advice I would give or advice I think I would listen to? Because uh, I think... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, saying, I don't know how to solve the second one. But I think what's interesting is I, I was very fortunate to have an incredible board and an incredible group of people around me when I was 19, 20, when we were doing Rocket All. And almost to a T every single one of them told me to slow down, breathe and enjoy the journey. Um, and I was obsessed with 16, 18 hour days, seven days a week push to get the exit. You either go public or you blow up and die. There is no other outcome and nothing else matters until you get there. And I lived in that state for probably four years and don't have a ton of context on like what happened in my life during that time outside of the, like the drive. And so if, if there's any way I could get myself to listen to that advice and enjoy the journey a little bit more and enjoy the people I get to see in the cities I went to, like, I remember, I think I was in New York three times for conferences and I literally went, and it was the first time I'd ever been in New York. And I literally went airport, hotel, hotel, conference room, speak, conference room, hotel, hotel, airport, gone. I was like, Oh, that was New York. Cool. In, out, gone. Um, and it wasn't until six, six or seven years later that I actually went back and like saw the city and did did some stuff did, and saw some other stuff, people. Yeah. 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 So final question. What's keeping you up at night these days? Ooh. Honestly, excitement. Like there's so much, so much opportunity right now with what we're seeing at the bleeding edge of AI and where I'm seeing at least like I, I host a dinner series across the country called Founder Dinners, 
And mm-hmm. the amount of kind of pent up enthusiasm and excitement from founders and community to reconnect with each other, to share stories, to share resources mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is at a level I've never experienced before. So I'm just, I'm really excited to be building in that space and really excited to see what kind of the next generation of technology enables for us. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty, it, it, it is an exciting time. I agree with you. Graham, that sounds, uh, in terms of the, the, this interview, it's been really great. Some, some super insights. Great having you on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. We'll have to okay. do it again. Okay, will do. I'm Phil Bliss. Been great seeing you. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter on our website and also subscribe on our YouTube channel uh, or on any of the major podcast channels that we're on. Thanks for listening to Canada's podcast, where you meet the entrepreneurs that drive Canada's economy. See you soon.